Welcome back to this series on topology. In today's video, we'll be looking at product spaces, which are a way to endow the Cartesian product of sets with a topology. You can find a playlist containing all the videos in this series by clicking on the info thing that should appear right now. We know from basic set theory that if we're given two sets A and B, we can form their Cartesian product A cross B, which is by definition just the set of ordered pairs, small a, small b, where small a lies in A and small b lies in B. Now the Cartesian product comes naturally equipped with two projection maps. So the first one will project A times B down to A, and the second map will project A times B down to B. And the first one I'll call pi A, and the second one pi B. What do these maps do? Well, if we have some element A comma B in the Cartesian product, then the projection down to the first component will just map this to the element small a, and the projection onto b will just map the tuple onto its second component, which is small b. It now happens that the Cartesian product is universal with respect to these types of projection maps. So what do I mean by this? So if we have some other set, t, and we have maps going from t to a, and t to b, then there exists a unique map, which I'll call u, from t into the Cartesian product a times b, making these two triangles here on the side commute. We can think about how we need to define this unique map u based on the definition of the Cartesian product. So if we call this map from t to a t a, and the map from t to b, t b, then u of some element x in t will be defined as the tuple that has as its first element the element t a of x, and as its second element the element t b of x. Now since t a is a map from t to a, this element t a of x will lie in the set a, and because t b is a map from t to b, the element tb of x will lie in the set b, and so in fact this tuple here is indeed an element of the Cartesian product a cross b. So indeed if we have some arbitrary set t equipped with these types of maps ta and tb to a and b respectively, then we can construct such a map u from t into the Cartesian product. Moreover, this map u will be unique amongst maps that make these two triangles here commute. Why is this? Well, the conditions for these two triangles to commute are the following. For the left-hand triangle, the condition is that the projection pi a after u needs to be equal to the map t a. And on the right, we need to have that the projection down to b after u is equal to t b. Now if you think about what this means on elements, this means that pi a after u of some element x needs to be equal to t a of x. So this is saying that the first component of whatever u maps into needs to be t a of x, and similarly for the second component we have that pi b after u of x needs to be t b of x. So this is saying that the second component of whatever we map this element x into needs to be tb. But we've now fixed the first component of whatever u needs to map x into and the second component, and this is exactly the definition we gave up here, and so there was no choice in how we could define ux if we want these triangles to commute. So just to recap, the Cartesian product of sets satisfies the following universal property. So it's a set with two projections down to its components. And moreover, for any other arbitrary set T, which has maps going from T to A and T to B, we have a unique map, U, going from T into the Cartesian product that makes these uh, two triangles here on the side commute. Not only does the Cartesian product of two sets satisfy this universal property, this universal property actually characterizes the Cartesian product of two sets up to isomorphism. 
This means that if you have any other set that also satisfies this universal property, then that set will be isomorphic to the Cartesian product that we've defined here in this way. If you're hearing this for the first time, this was probably all too fast. So I encourage you to maybe think about this some more and you'll undoubtedly uh, bump into the universal property for products again in your studies. However, all of this is just to say that these two projection maps that we have out of the Cartesian product are really essential for the productness of this set A times B. So far, we've just been thinking about sets and functions. So all of these uh, maps I've drawn in so far have just been functions between sets. But now we'd like to transition to topological spaces and we'd like to put topologies on all of these sets. The ingredients we'll start with are going to be two topological spaces, um, A and B, with topologies on them. And we'd like to form a product space between them, which has as an underlying set the Cartesian product of sets, but is endowed additionally with a topology such that this universal property we had for the product also holds in the category of topological spaces. What does this mean? Well, it means that in the universal property we saw before, we just replace the word set with topological space and the word function with continuous function. In other words, we would like the product space between the topological spaces A and B to be universal in the following sense. So we want it to have continuous maps, pi A and pi B, which project down to the spaces A and B. And moreover, we want that for any other topological space T, which has such continuous maps to A and B, that there exists a unique continuous map going from T into the product space. Since we want to keep the Cartesian product of sets as the underlying set for the product space, we only need to ask ourselves what type of topology we're going to put on this set. The other ingredients that we have given for our construction are these projection maps, which are as of now just functions. However, in order for this universal property to work in the category of topological spaces, these two projection maps will have to be continuous. And that's going to be a restriction on what kind of topology we can put on this Cartesian product of sets. So let's think about what the topology on the Cartesian product would have to satisfy in order for these two projections to be continuous functions. Suppose that we have some open set UA that's a subset of A, and also a set UB that's open in the topology on B. Now, if these projections are to be continuous, then the pre-images of these sets need to be open in the topology that we're going to put on the Cartesian product A times B. So we need that the pre-image of UA under pi A, that this is going to be open. But what is this? Well, the pre-image under the projection onto the first component of the set UA is just UA times the set why is this? Well, the pre-image of a set is just all the points in the source set that get mapped to that specific set. So if I have some arbitrary element AB, that's going to be mapped by pi A just onto A. So this part of the element doesn't matter uh, for the image. So the only thing we need in order for the image under pi A to lie in the set UA is that a needs to be an element of UA. Hence, the elements of the pre-image are going to be exactly the elements in UA cross B. Similarly, the pre-image under the projection onto the second component, pi B, of UB is going to be A cross UB. And now, if these two projections are to be continuous, then both of these sets here need to be open. And moreover, they need to be open for any choice of open sets UA and UB. Moreover, because the intersection of open sets also needs to be open, if these two sets are to be open, then also UA times B intersection A times B.
times UB needs to be open, and this is the same as the set UA times UB. Observe also that if all sets of the type UA times UB for UA open in A and UB open in B, if all of these are open, then in particular also these types of sets will be open because the entire space A is open in A and the entire space B is open in B. So this condition here on the right, that UA times UB needs to be open for all uh, UA sub A open and all UB subset of B open. This is really the condition we're going to be looking for in order to make these two projections, pi A and pi B, continuous. All right, so we've now found a necessary condition in order for these to be continuous. So if pi A and pi B are continuous, then this condition down here will hold. On the other hand, there might be many topologies for which this condition holds and hence make the maps pi A and pi B continuous. So we need to pick a topology out of the set of topologies that fulfill this condition to put on the Cartesian product. So the question becomes, which of these topologies that satisfy the condition will be the right one for our product space? And the answer to this question comes again from thinking about the universal property we'll want the product space to satisfy. So remember that for the product space, we'll want that for any other topological space that has maps, in this case, continuous maps going from it to A and B, we'll want there to be a unique continuous map going from that space T into our product space. Now, in particular, we could choose T to be A cross B with some other topology on it. And moreover, we can then choose these maps TA and TB to also be the projection maps pi A and pi B respectively. And now in this case, the unique map U will just be the identity on the underlying set A times B. Choosing the identity here obviously makes these two triangles on the side commute because composing pi A with the identity just gives back pi A and similarly for pi B. So the question that remains is whether this identity map here is continuous. And this question will depend on what the topology on the product space is and what this other topology is on the Cartesian product up here, which might not be the same as the one we put on the product space. However, both of the topologies on each of these sets needs to make these guys here continuous, which means that they satisfy this condition down here. So for any two topologies we could put on the set A cross B that satisfy this condition, we can build such a diagram and now we want this identity function between them to be continuous. And we'll see in a moment that in fact this will restrict the topologies we can put on the product um, down to just one. For convenience, let's call this condition down here star and let's suppose that tau and tau prime are topologies on A times B, so this is the Cartesian product as seen as a set, satisfy this star. Now let's think about what it would mean for the identity function on A times B to be continuous. So in here we're thinking about this first Cartesian product as being endowed with a topology tau and the second Cartesian product as being endowed with a topology tau prime. So if the identity is continuous, this means that for any element u, so that's an open set that lives in tau prime, its pre-image under the identity needs to be an open set of tau. So we have that the pre-image under the identity of u needs to lie in tau. But of course, the pre-image under the identity is just the set itself. So we can get rid of the uh, pre-image part. 
So this is saying that if the identity function is continuous, then any open set in tau prime will also lie in tau. So the continuity of the identity is equivalent to tau prime being contained in tau. And now finally, this equivalence will show us what the right topology is going to be to choose for this product space. So we know that whatever topology we choose, it has to fulfill the condition star. And now moreover, if we had two such topologies, tau and tau prime, that satisfy star, we want this identity map here to be continuous if we think about the space where we have the topology tau on the first one and the topology tau prime, which will be the proper topology for the product on the second space. And now if this identity is going to be continuous, we want the topology tau prime to be contained in the topology tau, which means that regardless which topology we choose on the product space, it'll need to be contained in any other topology tau that satisfies star. In other words, in order to get the right topology on the product space, we need to take the smallest topology that satisfies this condition star. All right, let's recap this rather long argument for how we need to choose the topology on the Cartesian product in order to get a product space. So we saw first that the Cartesian product in the category of sets satisfies a universal property with respect to projections to the components A and B. And now we would like to have a similar situation happening in the category of topological spaces. So that is, we want our product space to satisfy exactly the same universal property as the Cartesian product does in set. However, we want all the objects involved to be topological spaces and all the maps involved to be continuous. So in particular, this means that these projection functions pi a and pi b need to be continuous. Now we saw that the continuity of these two projections means that sets of the type ua times ub, where ua is an open set of a and ub is an open set of b, these types of products need to be open in the topology we're going to put on the product space. Hence, making these two projections continuous already restricts the class of topologies we can put on the Cartesian product. However, there are still going to be a bunch of different topologies we could put on it that satisfy this condition. So we need to further narrow down this uh, class of topologies in order to find the right one to put on the product space. We then saw that if we have two topologies, tau and tau prime, on this Cartesian product that satisfy star, well then the projections out of both of these topologies would be continuous. So we can draw this diagram that I still have here. So we put tau on the top uh, Cartesian product and tau prime on the bottom one. And then because both of them satisfy star, we have projections that are continuous maps going from either of them into the sets A and B. Now, if we want this uh, space here to satisfy the universal property of products, then in particular, this identity function here would have to be continuous because that's uh, the map, the unique map that will complete this diagram. And in order for it to complete the diagram in the category of topological spaces, we need it to be a continuous map. Now, what does it mean for this identity to be continuous? Well, we saw down here that it means that any open set in tau prime needs to also be an open set in tau, which means that the topology tau prime is contained in the topology tau. Therefore, for any two topologies we could put on the Cartesian product that satisfies star, the actual topology we're going to put on the product space needs to be contained in this other topology, meaning that the topology on the product space needs to be the smallest topology that satisfies star. 
In other words, the product between two topological spaces will be the space whose underlying set is the Cartesian product of sets of the underlying sets of the spaces and whose topology is generated by sets of the following form ua times ub where ua is open in a and ub is open in b. This definition is restated in a little more generality here. So we let x1 through xn be topological spaces. Then the product topology on their Cartesian product x1 times dot 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 times xn is the topology that's generated by the basis curly b. And this contains as basis elements sets u1 times dot 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 times un where each ui is an open set in the corresponding space xi. This definition still uses the concept of a basis, so it can be slightly more explicit in our description of the topology on the product space by just um, applying the definition of what it means to be a basis for a topological space. Recall that if curly B is a basis, then the open sets on the topology generated by that basis are just unions of basis elements. So if we take some arbitrary open set U, which is an open set in this product space X1 times and so on times Xn, then U will be a union over basis elements Bi where bi has the form u1 times and so on up to un, where, where ui is open in the space xi. For example, we could consider the topology on the product space r times r, where we put the usual topology on the real line. Now, open sets of the real line are unions of open intervals. So we might have some open set like this on the first copy of the real line and some open set like this on the second. And now we consider the product of these two open sets. So that'll be two rectangles like this. And now the set of all these types of products will form a basis for the topology on the product r times r, which will actually coincide with the usual topology we would put on the Euclidean space r2. Conversely, if we're given some arbitrary set in the product topology, we can ask whether it's open. And by the basis criterion, this set will be open precisely when, for each point in the set, so this is some point x, we can find a basis element that is entirely contained in the set we're interested in. So we need to find some basis element that is contained in the green set that also contains the point x. And in our picture, for example, we could choose a small rectangle around x, and this rectangle will be the product of these two open intervals of the real line, and hence will be a basis element of this form. So if we can find such a small open rectangle around each point in the green set, such that that open rectangle is contained in the green set, then uh, in fact this green set will be open in the product topology of R and R. And this also shows why the product topology between two copies of the real line coincides with the usual topology we put on the plane R2 because um, looking at the topology generated by open rectangles is equivalent to the topology generated by open balls. Next, we'll look at a reformulation of the universal property we saw at the beginning of this lecture in terms of continuous maps into the product and into the components of the product. And this phrasing here is just convenient if you want to show that certain maps involving the product are continuous. So it says that for any space y and function from y to the product space between x1 up to xn, f is continuous if and only if each of the component functions fi 
which is just shorthand for the projection pi i after f, if all of these component functions are continuous. The statement is easier to parse if we look at the following diagram. So we're saying that we choose some arbitrary space y and arbitrary function f into the product space. Now the claim is that this function f is continuous if and only if each of the composites pi 1 after f, so that's these fi here, are continuous for every one of the components xi. In other words, we can investigate the continuity of a function f into the product by just looking at each of these component maps fi which go from y to the component xi. And conversely, if we have a family of continuous maps fi like this, then we can assemble them into a continuous map from y into the product. Because this is a reformulation of things we did before, there's actually not a whole lot to prove. We already know by our argument for how to construct the topology on the product space that each of these pi i's is a continuous map. This means that if the function f is continuous, then also the composite of the continuous map f with these continuous projections is going to be continuous for every i. Hence, this direction just follows from the fact that each of these projections is continuous if we put the product topology uh, on the Cartesian product here. Conversely, suppose that we have a family of functions fi which are continuous for every index i. Then by the universal property for the product, there's going to exist a unique map u, which is continuous going from y to the product. Moreover, u will make all of the triangles commute, so this means that pi i after u is equal to fi for all i. In the first part of the lecture, I stated the universal property when i is 1 and 2, so we only have two components for the product, but more generally this universal property holds if we have an arbitrary number of components, and in that case we have that all triangles in question commute, so we have this condition pi i after u is fi for all indices i. On the other hand, by assumption, pi i after f is equal to f i as well for all i. So we don't know if f is continuous or not, but we can compare u and f just by considering the underlying sets of the spaces in question. So the same universal property holds if we just think of this product as a product of sets and we think of all the maps just as being functions between sets. So also in this case, there exists a unique function u such that u makes all of these triangles commute, so this condition holds, and we also know that u is unique in this case. However, f is also a function from y into this product that makes all of these triangles commute, so satisfies these conditions, and now the uniqueness of this type of function implies that u is equal to f as a function. But now we know, because of the universal property for the product space, that u is continuous. And now because u is equal to f, this means that f is also going to be continuous. So we've shown that if we have such a family of fi's as here, then this means that this function f is going to be continuous. So this argument I just gave uses the universal property for products of sets and also for products of topological spaces and sort of uses the interplay between them in order to show that this unique continuous map u we get from the universal property of topological spaces means that u is equal to f as a function 
and hence also means that f is continuous. Instead of giving such an abstract argument using the universal properties, we can also do this more directly. So again, assume that this condition here on the right holds, and we now want to show that the map f is continuous. Now, the continuity of f just means that the preimage of any open set in this product needs to be open in y. So we let u be some arbitrary open set in x1 times and so on up to xn. And we now consider the preimage of u under f. Okay, so u is open, forgot to write that down, which means that u is going to be a union of basis elements. So this is um, how we define the topology on the product. We had it defined in terms of a basis, and here each bi is equal to some v1 times and so on up to vn, where each vi is open in xi. That's just the definition of the product topology. So in fact, we can rewrite u in this preimage here as this union over these bi's. And now by properties of preimages, the preimage of a union is equal to the union over the preimages. And now we recall that these bi's are of the form v1 times to vn. So uh, maybe we also need to include the index i here because the these open sets v, i will depend on which basis element they're in. On the other hand, this is equal to the union over the following intersection of preimages. So this is the union over the preimage under the first component function of v1 i intersected with, and so on, intersected with the preimage under the nth component function fn of vn i. This is one of those things that if it isn't clear to you, you should definitely write out a short proof to convince yourself that this is in fact the case. Okay, now we know that each of the vi's, so these v1i up to vni is open by assumption, and we know also by assumption that each of these component functions fi is continuous, meaning that these preimages are all open sets, and now we have intersected finitely many of them, and so the finite intersection of these open sets is again an open set, so this whole thing here is open, and then we take a union over open sets, which will again be open, so this entire thing here is open, and we show that this is equal to the preimage of this arbitrary open set u. Hence, in conclusion, we started with an open set, and the product looked at its preimage under f and showed that this is open, meaning that the map f is continuous, and this concludes uh, the second proof of this other direction. So you can think about the proof of this other direction whatever way you want. You can either use this explicit argument that's now in green, or you could think about it in a more abstract way using the universal property for both the product of sets and the product of topological spaces. And in fact, this more concrete proof also, in a way, uses the universal property for products of sets in the step here, where we showed that the preimage of this product is actually equal to an intersection over preimages of these components. Okay, so all of this might seem a bit abstract, but I'd like to emphasize that this characteristic property here is actually really useful in practice as well, because we can check whether a function into a product space is continuous simply by checking each of the component functions. So that uh, can be much easier in some cases. And moreover, if we have given some component functions, then we can assemble them into a continuous function which goes into the product space. This type of mentality of assembling component functions between component spaces into functions between product spaces is further 
uh, explored in the following definition. So suppose we're given continuous maps fi from some spaces xi to yi. Then we can define a product of these functions as follows. So this product of functions will now be a continuous map from the product space x1 up through xn to the product space y1 up to yn. What does it do? Well, it takes a element x1 up through xn and maps it to the element f1 of x1 and so on up to fn of xn. So we just apply each of these component functions to each component in the product. Now here we've given an explicit definition of what this map does, but you can actually also show that such a product of uh, maps has to exist based on the universal property of the product. So for example, let's just take two components. So we have some map f1 going from x1 to y1 and another map going from x2 to y2, which is called f2. And now we know that y1 and y2 have a product y1 cross y2, which includes projections down to each of the components. And similarly, x1 and x2 have a product x1 times x2 that include these projections down to x1 and x2. However, we can now compose these maps uh, f1 and f2 with the projections out of x1 times x2. So we can consider these composite maps. And now these are maps from the product x1 times x2 into y1 and y2 respectively. So therefore, by the universal property of the product of y1 and y2, there has to be a unique continuous map going from this x1 times x2 into the product y1, y2. And this unique continuous map is precisely the product map between f1 and f2. So this is just to show that the existence of these products of maps follows from the abstract universal properties of products that we have for these product spaces. And if you unravel what the definitions are for uh, these um, product spaces, then you'll find that this product of maps needs to be defined exactly as we did here in this definition. Okay, so the advantage of doing this abstract thing is that we automatically know that this product of maps is going to be continuous because that's guaranteed to us by the universal property. On the other hand, if we do this explicit definition and just start with it, we have to prove that this uh, product of maps is continuous. In this case, I think it's simpler just to make this explicit definition and then prove that this product of maps is continuous if each of the component maps is continuous. So this is the content of the following proposition, or at least the first part. So it says that if each of these component functions is continuous, then also the product of them defined in this way is continuous. So let's give a proof of this fact. For this, we need to take some open set u in y1 times and so on up to yn. And we need to consider the pre-image of u under this product map. Now again, by the definition of the product topology, we know that u is going to be a big union over some basis elements bi, where each bi is again some v1i times and so on up to the ni, where each v1, uh, maybe vji, is open in yi. So this set here is the same as the pre-image under the product map of this union of the bi's. And again, by properties of pre-images, this is the union over the pre-images of each of these bi's. But what are these bi? Well, these are just products of these v1i up to vni. 
And now we need to think about what the pre-image of such a product V1i up to Vni is under the product map F1 cross and so on up to Fn. Well, using the definition, it's easy to verify that this is the same thing as taking the product of the pre-images under each of the component functions. So that's the pre-image under F1 of V1i up to the product with the pre-image under Fn of Vni. This equality here is again something that's probably best to verify on your own. So the reason this works out is essentially because in this definition, um, all of these uh, component functions act independently on each component. Okay, so we've rewritten the pre-image under this product function of an arbitrary open set U in this following form down here. And now by assumption, each of these VJI is open in YI and each of the FI is continuous, which means that these guys here, uh, these components occurring in the product are open sets in each of the XI's. Therefore, this entire product here has the form uh, u1 times u2 and so on times un, where each of the ui's is an open set of xi. In other words, this set here is a basis element of the topology on the product space x1 times and so on up to xn. Being a basis element means in particular being an open set. And so we've expressed this pre-image here as a union over some open sets. So it's open, thus making this product map continuous. All right, so that proves this first part of the proposition, showing that indeed, if we define this product of maps as we did above, then it will be a continuous map if each of the component maps is continuous. Okay, now this proposition also has a second part, which is saying that if each of the component maps is not only continuous, but a homeomorphism, then also the product between them is going to be a homeomorphism. Intuitively, this again follows from the fact that the way we've defined this product map means that essentially each of these components is being acted on independently by the component functions. Okay, so let's check the second part of this proposition. So we assume that each of these fi is a homeomorphism. Now, what does this mean? Well, it means that for each fi, there is a continuous map fi inverse such that fi composed with fi inverse is the identity on yi and such that fi inverse composed with fi is the identity on xi. In other words, each fi is a continuous map that has a continuous two-sided inverse. Okay, so now all we need to do is we need to find a two-sided continuous inverse for this product of the continuous maps F1 up to Fn. So here the claim is that F1 inverse times and so on up to Fn inverse is a two-sided continuous inverse to the product map F1 times and so on up to Fn. Well, because each of the components um, Fi inverse is continuous by assumption, it means that by the first part of this proposition, also this product of them is going to be continuous. So we know that this thing, if it's a two-sided inverse, it will be continuous. So the only thing we need to show is that in fact it is a two-sided inverse of this guy viewed just as a function. In order to do this, we just need to check these two conditions here um, applied to these two maps. 
The first thing we'll check is that if we apply f1 times and so on up to fn after f1 inverse times and so on up to fn inverse, this would be applied to some element of the product space y1 up to yn. And such an element has components y1 comma up to yn. We need to check that this composition is the identity on the product y1 up to yn. OK, but by definition, if we first evaluate this function here, this is going to be f1 inverse of y1 comma up to fn inverse of yn. And now if we evaluate um, this point here with the components f1 inverse y1 and so on, if we evaluate this under the product map f1 to fn, by definition, this evaluation here is going to be f1 of f1 inverse of y1 and so on up to fn of fn inverse of yn. And now we see what's happening. Well, each of these here is just going to be y1 and so on. And this last one here is going to be yn because each fi inverse is inverse to fi. So in fact, this whole thing here is just the same as y1 comma up to yn. And this shows that this uh, product of the inverses is a right inverse to the product of the maps. Now we also need to check the second identity where the order of these two maps in questions are reversed. So that's considering f1 inverse times and so on up to fn inverse after f1 times and so on up to fn. And this would have to be applied to an element of the product x1 up through xn. So that's a tuple x1 up through xn. And now again, applying the definition twice, we see that if we evaluate this, we get f1 inverse of f1 of x1, comma, and so on up to fn inverse of fn of xn, because each of these component maps is inverse to the corresponding uh, component map. This is the same as x1 up to xn. OK, so we showed that indeed this map here is a two-sided inverse to this map. And moreover, it's continuous by the first part of the proposition. And together, this shows that the product map we were considering, f1 up through fn, is a homeomorphism if each of the components is a homeomorphism. In summary, this definition and proposition gives us another useful way of working with products by just working with the components of the products. So if we have some maps between the components, then we can assemble these into maps between uh, the corresponding product spaces. And the maps thus assembled will be continuous if each of the component maps is continuous. And moreover, if each of them is even a homeomorphism, then so is the product of those maps. I'd like to conclude this video by listing some other useful properties of product spaces, but without proving them. The first property A says that each projection out of the product space is in fact an open map. So what does this mean? Well, it simply means that if we have some subset U of the product x1 up through xn, so this is open, then also pi i of u is open, and in this case for each i. In other words, if you project an open set onto any one of the components, what you'll end up with is again an open set. The second property states that if we have bases for each of the component spaces xi, then we can obtain a basis for the product space simply by taking products of basis elements. So remember that in general, the topology on the product space is generated by a basis where we consider products of open sets in each of the components. 
However, if we have expressed the topology on each component in terms of a basis, then it suffices to just consider products of basis elements. So this collection curly B here is potentially smaller than the collection one would consider if one looks at all products of open sets in each of the component spaces. Next, property C expresses some compatibility between the subspace topology and the product topology. It says that if we have subspaces of each of the component spaces, then the product topology on the product of these subspaces and the subspace topology on this product considered as a subspace of the product x1 through xn, these two topologies coincide. So again, either we could just consider each of these SI as topological spaces in their own right and take their product and look at the product topology. So that's the first option. Or we could take the product of these XI, consider the product topology on X1 up through Xn and think about S1 times and so on up to Sn as a subspace of this product space. So that gives us two ways of obtaining a topology on this set, S1 times and so on up to Sn. And part C is now saying that these two ways of obtaining a topology on this set are the same. In practice, this means that if one is dealing with subspaces and one is taking some products, then one doesn't have to worry about which order one is doing the taking of subspaces and the taking of products in. Okay, and finally part D says that taking products of topological spaces preserves one, the Hausdorff property of those spaces. So if each of the component spaces is Hausdorff, then also the product space will be Hausdorff. And then it also preserves first and second countability. So if each of the component spaces is first countable, then so is the product space. And if each of the component spaces is second countable, then also the product space is second countable. We can apply these properties together with some of the things we saw before in order to obtain the following corollary. It says that the product of topological manifolds is again a topological manifold. And this is good news because it gives us a way of um, getting a lot of examples of topological manifolds. Namely, we just need to take products of them. Recall that a topological manifold is the same thing as a second countable Hausdorff space that is locally Euclidean of dimension n. For more information on topological manifolds, you can see uh, the previous video on this topic. So now to prove this corollary, we assume that M and N are topological manifolds. And now we need to show that M times N is again a topological manifold. So in particular, we know that M and N are both gonna be second countable and Hausdorff. So by the properties we saw previously, which stated that products preserve second countability and Hausdorffness, it means that the product M times N will again be second countable and Hausdorff. So the fact that M times N is second countable and Hausdorff follows by uh, property D we saw on the last slide. So the only thing we need to check is that M times N is again locally Euclidean of dimension N. Now the dimension of this product of manifolds will be the sum of the dimensions of the component manifolds. To check that the product of M and N is locally Euclidean of some dimension, we consider the following. So we draw M times N here and we look at some point x, y in m times n, where x lies in m and y lies in n. Now, recall that being locally Euclidean of dimension n means that for each point, 
in the space, there needs to be a neighborhood around it. So an open set containing that point that is homeomorphic to some open set of Rn. So what we need to do is we need to find an open set that contains the point xy that is homeomorphic to some open set of Euclidean space. Now, how do we go about this? Well, we know that the manifold M is Euclidean of some dimension and also the manifold N is Euclidean of some dimension. So we can project this product M times N down to the individual components M and N. So this means we have the point X in M and the point Y in N. And now because M is locally Euclidean of dimension, say M, this means that there is an open neighborhood around X, which I'll call UX. And moreover, this UX is homeomorphic to some open set in Euclidean space, which I'll call uh, VX. And similarly for N, because N is locally Euclidean of dimension, uh, say N, we'll have an open set UY around Y that is homeomorphic to an open set Vy in Euclidean space Rn. And up here, this is the Euclidean space Rm because M is locally Euclidean of dimension small m and N is locally Euclidean of dimension small n. All right, but this now solves our problem because we can now just set the neighborhood that we're looking for, this red one, to be ux times uy. And now if we call this homeomorphism from ux to vx phi x and the homeomorphism from uy to vy phi y, we can now form the product of these two continuous maps as we saw in the definition a few slides ago in order to get a homeomorphism phi x times phi y from ux times ui to vx times vy. And now vx times vy lives in the space rm times rn. Now there are a few things to check. Well, first we need to know that this ux times ui is indeed open, but this is the case because it's a product of open sets of the component spaces. So in particular, it's a basis element of the product topology and hence open. And then also there's a question of why this product map here is a homeomorphism, but this follows from the proposition we saw and proved just after giving the definition of maps. Namely, if we have two continuous maps that are each homeomorphisms, then also their product is a homeomorphism. And similarly, um, to the first part of the argument, this Vx times Vy is also gonna be an open set in Rm times Rn. So for any point x comma y in the product manifold M times N, we found an open neighborhood uh, containing x, y, that is homeomorphic to some open set of Rm times Rn. And this in turn means that M times N is locally Euclidean of dimension M plus N. This is simply because uh, Rm times Rn is isomorphic to Rm plus N. Okay, so we've seen that if we have two topological manifolds, we can form their product and what we get is again a topological manifold. For example, if we consider the circle S1, this is a topological manifold, which means we can form the product of S1 with S1. And this is called the torus. And it looks like the surface of a donut so this is the donut shape where we're just thinking about the surface of it. And the copies of S1 that lie within it are one goes around sort of the, uh, the one side of the donut and the other goes around in this direction. So those are the two copies of S1 embedded into the torus and the torus is their product. 
Now by this corollary, because each of these is a topological manifold, we also know that the torus is a topological manifold. All right, this concludes what I wanted to say about product spaces. Next time we'll be continuing the theme of constructing new topological spaces from old ones by looking at disjoint union spaces.